really excited to welcome you. Uh, this is one of the webinars that's part of our Survive and Thrive 2021 Lunch and Learn series. Uh, this series is directed by myself and Dr. Barrett Stearns, the head of the Johns Hopkins Women's Malignancies Program, with a great planning committee, um, all of whom are listed below, and one of whom, Christine Hodgson, is on the webinar today. The title of today's talk is What's New and on the Horizon for Metastatic Breast Cancer. We are going to be hearing from Dr. Aditya Bardia, who is a breast cancer medical oncologist and assistant professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School based out of Massachusetts General Hospital, um, a breast cancer expert and also formerly trained at Johns Hopkins, so very well known to our group. Um, the session will be moderated by myself, a breast cancer medical oncologist with a particular interest in uh, reducing symptoms and toxicity associated with therapy and survivorship care, and also by Christine Hodgson, who is a very experienced uh, breast cancer patient navigator and also co-founder of GRASP, which is an organization called Guiding Researchers and Advocates to Scientific Partnership. And we are also going to be hearing from Jamil Rivers, who's going to be giving us the patient voice on this topic. And I'm going to let Christine introduce Jamil for everybody. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And thank you, everybody, for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce Jamil Rivers. She is a superstar advocate, very well known in the metastatic breast cancer community. She was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer at the age of 39. And since then, she has been hitting the ground running, doing so much work. For the day, I have a good weekend. All right, same to you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. She's actually the president of Metaviver, and she also founded a organization called the Chrysalis Initiative, which provides mentoring and resource navigation to women with breast cancer, and it also engages in outreach and education for African-American women to assess their breast cancer risk. So we welcome Jamil. Thank you for coming. Thank you Jim. for inviting me, Christine. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, our goal is to hear from Dr. Bardia for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to turn to Jamil for about a five minute perspective, and then we're going to leave 20 minutes open for uh, questions and answers. Um, participants, you will be muted during the webinar, and we'd really like you to type your questions into the chat box or even preferably the Q&A function. We will try to answer some of them even during the presentation if they're quick, um, but if they're great and ideal for discussion, um, Christine and I will be reviewing them and selecting them um, to pose to Dr. Bardia or Jamil during the Q&A. We will do our best to get to everybody's questions. Um, after the webinar is complete, you will receive an email with a evaluation. We'd really appreciate it if you could please send it back within seven days. We definitely use this information for planning for future programs and new initiatives. So we really appreciate your feedback and you taking the time. And now for Dr. Bardia's presentation, I'm gonna just uh, stop sharing and we will switch over to Dr. Bardia. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stearns and the planning committee for this uh, kind invitation. Um, I would be reviewing what's new and on the horizon for metastatic breast cancer uh, with a patient-centered approach. So I'm a breast medical oncologist and would like to start with a patient story. Uh, this is a patient with metastatic ER positive breast cancer, was diagnosed with ER positive breast cancer localized in 2000, received five years of tamoxifen as per recommendations at that time. Now we would say 10. Then in 2015 had disease recurrence in the bone. The biopsy revealed hormone receptor positive or to negative breast cancer. Patient received letrozole plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Eventually had disease progression and the question is what therapy should be considered next? If we look at our standard guidelines, there are a number of standard therapies one could consider. This is from 2017. Not much has uh, changed in terms of standard chemotherapy in this setting, but there are newer targeted therapies. And if we look at the approach of a patient with uh, ER positive metastatic breast cancer, 
Uh, it's usually to use endocrine therapies first, such as uh, letrozole or arom other aromatase inhibitors in combination with CDK4-6 inhibitor, uh, tamoxifen, exemestinevrolimus, then consider chemotherapy, um, consider clinical trials. The problem with the sequential approach is that it's blind to what's happening in the tumor. It's not based on tumor biology and potentially could delay access to effective therapies. And that's where tumor genotyping comes in. Uh, Plasma-based genotyping can allow for repeated non-invasive specimens uh, that are available, which could be utilized for molecular profiling. So that's the advantage of doing a liquid biopsy. It's tough to do repeated tissue biopsies to understand what's happening at a molecular level. But through a blood draw, if you can do a liquid biopsy, you can understand what's happening uh, from a tumor biology perspective, understand evolution, which potentially uh, could help guide therapy and we'll review that. So coming back to this patient um, who had prog disease progression on letrozole plus CDK4-6 inhibitor, we were discussing what therapy to choose next. This patient had plasma-based genotyping done or looking at what we call circulating tumor DNA, essentially fragments of the tumor uh, that can be detected from uh, blood-based analysis. So the circulating tumor DNA revealed presence of a mutation in the estrogen receptor. Um, and so let's review what does uh, estrogen receptor mutation or ESR1 mutation mean. Biologically, if we look at a tumor that's hormone receptor positive, um, when the tumor has disease progression on standard endocrine therapy, conceptually, it could be divided into two broad categories. The first is that the estrogen receptor is still active. The tumor is still driven by the estrogen receptor. And an example being when there's an acquisition of ESR1 mutation. When there's a mutation in the estrogen receptor, the tumor is still driven by the estrogen receptor, but it becomes estrogen independent. And we know that aromatase inhibitors lower estrogen. So when there's a mutation in the estrogen receptor, the tumor becomes resistant to aromatase inhibitors because it's independent of estrogen. It can still signal despite there being uh, no presence of estrogen. So when there's a mutation in the estrogen uh, receptor, the tumor is estrogen dependent, uh, estrogen receptor dependent. It's estrogen independent, but still dependent on the estrogen receptor. So drugs that could directly target the estrogen receptor potentially could have a role. And that's what's being investigated over the past few years with the development of the so-called oral SIRDs or oral agents which selectively target the estrogen receptor. Selective estrogen receptor degrader or SIRDs. There are a number of SIRDs in development. Uh, one of the SIRDs which is uh, furthest along in development is a drug called elacestrant. Uh, it's a drug which targets the estrogen receptor directly. In a phase one, phase two clinical trial that we and other uh, centers were involved with, in patients who had received a prior endocrine therapy and had disease progression on prior endocrine therapy, when we looked at the presence of uh, estrogen receptor mutations, a subset of patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer had detectable uh, ESR1 mutations. And particularly in this group, you could see that uh, this drug was effective in controlling the disease. There are a number of other estrogen receptor degraders in development by different companies. And the idea is that you have a different mechanism that can target uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. There are a couple of caveats that I would like to mention. The first is that um, the phase two, three clinical trials with these compounds are ongoing. It's not ready for a routine uh, clinical practice yet. Um, if these trials show that these agents are effective and they get approved, that's when it could be used uh, in routine clinical practice. At this time, the best way to get access to these ER degraders is through a clinical trial. The other thing I would caution about is that we need to be careful in comparing these various trials. You'll see information 
that this drug has this activity or that drug has uh, this activity. And these are different studies. So we need to be careful in doing cross-trial comparisons. Uh, and at this time, we don't know whether one ER degrader is necessarily better than the other. They are being investigated in clinical trials. So uh, this patient had a uh, presence of an ESR1 mutation, uh, then started therapy with a selective estrogen receptor degrader in a clinical trial. We monitored the uh, ESR1 levels based on ctDNA, and we could see a decline in the estrogen receptor mutation based on uh, ctDNA analysis. Eventually, uh, the patient had disease progression. Then we did ctDNA analysis again. And now uh, there was another mutation uh, that was discovered based on ctDNA analysis, a mutation in HER2, something that was not present before. So how does this fit in our diagram that we had reviewed previously? We had reviewed that uh, tumors can uh, become resistant when they acquire mutations in the estrogen receptor, which makes them estrogen independent, but still dependent uh, on the estrogen receptor. What can happen over time is that tumor can become both estrogen and ER independent. Uh, for example, a mutation in HER2 would allow signaling through the growth factor receptors. And in such a situation, the tumor is um, resistant to both direct ER therapies as well as estrogen therapies. And this also highlights something that we increasingly see in metastatic breast cancer, which is tumor heterogeneity, where a tumor which starts in a certain format under selective pressure from therapies um, acquires new mutations and becomes heterogeneous. And a classic example is this patient who initially had a tumor uh, that was uh, ER sensitive, then acquired a mutation in the estrogen receptor and now a mutation in the HER2 receptor. So over time under selective pressure, there could be tumor evolution and genomic heterogeneity. But this also allows uh, for selection of targeted therapies. For example, in this patient, uh, when the HER2 mutation was uh, identified, the patient then enrolled in a clinical trial uh, with neratinib, uh, a drug that targets the HER2 receptor. And because the patient had ear positive disease, we continued endocrine therapy with Vaslodex. Um, patient had a nice response in the liver with this combination therapy. We also monitored the levels of HER2 and ESR1, and you could see a decline with this combination therapy. Eventually, the patient had disease progression, and then other therapies were selected. But this brings this general point of how uh, we can do liquid biopsies to identify actionable target. And if there's an actionable target that gets identified, the appropriate target therapy could be selected. Uh, patient gets monitored closely. If at some point the therapy stops working, there's disease progression, you could again do molecular evaluation. And if there's another actionable target identified, another uh, target therapy could be selected. So this loop where based on liquid biopsies, you can identify actionable target and select uh, targeted therapies. If you look at the current summary of the various actionable targets and therapies, uh, there are multiple uh, actionable targets for a patient with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. Examples include PI3 kinase inhibitor for PIK3CA mutant breast cancer. This is now FD approved with a drug called albelacib or PICRE. Uh, selective estrogen receptor degraders for ESR1 mutant breast cancer, as we reviewed. Uh, HER2 tyrosine kinase inhibitors for HER2 mutant breast cancer, uh, available in the form of a clinical trial. AKT inhibitors for AKT mutant breast cancer, again in a clinical trial. And then also other drugs like PARP inhibitors for um, BRCA mutant breast cancer. Besides these mutations, there's also interest in gene amplifications such as FGFR and MET. And the idea being that if you identify a genomic alteration that's likely going to be a driver alteration, you can select appropriate targeted therapy. 
Now, how about uh, HER2 positive uh, breast cancer? This has been the poster child of precision medicine in breast cancer. Uh, example of a patient who had a metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer, initially received uh, a regimen called THP in the first line setting, and then TDM1 in the second line setting for metastatic breast cancer. A disease progression on TDM1, and the question is what should be the next therapy um, for this patient with HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, trastuzumab deroxetan, capecitabine trastuzumab to catnib, capecitabine lapatnib, or a clinical trial. The point here is that all of these are correct answers. Uh, there are multiple options available for a patient with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, and clinical trial is always uh, something to consider uh, in this setting. So if you look at the various therapies for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer over the past uh, 18 months, there have been multiple agents that have been approved uh, by the FDA for patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Trastuzumab deroxetan, which is an agent um, that targets HER2, has chemo linked to it. It's more of a smart bomb where the uh, antibody can attach to the tumor and then deliver or the chemo to the tumor cells, to catnib, which is an agent that blocks HER2, uh, along with capecitabine and trastuzumab. Neratinib is another uh, oral agent that blocks HER2, FD approved in combination with capecitabine. Uh, mergituximab, which is an agent like trastuzumab, but has uh, slightly different properties, particularly in terms of its ability to enhance the immune system. So there are multiple options available for patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. In the clinic, the choice is dictated by the safety profile, patient preference, the site of metastatic disease, and prior therapy. Now, there are multiple therapies available. Uh, we can do routine genotyping. A challenge that we are now encountering in clinic is that uh, Routine tumor genotyping can identify sometimes multiple alterations, and there are multiple therapies that one can use to target those alterations. For example, as you can see on this slide, um, this is an example of a genotyping report from a patient uh, whose tumor genotyping identified alterations in BRCA, in HERD2, in FGFR, in BRAF. And we have targeted the therapies against all of these alterations. So sometimes it leads to this challenge um, that how can we identify the best therapy for an individual patient when there are multiple actionable alterations? Ultimately, this needs to be guided by uh, the clonality, the impact of these uh, coexisting alterations and also access to these therapies. At our institution, uh, we've started a virtual clinic. It's like a virtual tumor board, a virtual clinic, where the idea is uh, when a patient with metastatic breast cancer um, is seen for a new diagnosis or has disease progression and has a genotyping report that can be complex, the team can send an email to the service. The service helps with the genomic testing interpretation, discusses the various recommendations, looks for clinical trial options, as a research nurse that can potentially pre-screen to see if these uh, clinical trial options would be viable, uh, viable. And then the recommendation is provided back to the provider. And that could be that continuous standard therapy or there's another standard therapy that's available. It could be that there's a, a targeted therapy that could be considered, or it could be that there's a clinical trial that would be best for this patient. So the idea is to have this team uh, that can help with uh, decision-making and can provide support um, for a patient with uh, metastatic breast cancer. Now, how about the opposite scenario? We reviewed a couple of situations where based on sequencing, one could identify actionable alterations. What if there are no actionable alterations and how do you address tumor heterogeneity, which is particularly a uh, problem for patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So let me review the uh, third patient story. Uh, this is a young patient who had uh, initially hormone receptor positive breast cancer, but then at the time of metastatic disease, 
had uh, triple negative breast cancer. The tumor was ERPR number two negative. Received carboplatin initially, uh, then received capecitabine, and then received irribulin. The patient had disease progression after these uh, three chemo agents, and the question was what therapy should uh, one consider next? Now, this was a cheerful lady, and her question was, you know, you're telling me all about triple negative breast cancer, but why do we call this triple negative breast cancer? The uh, term triple negative uh, has a negative connotation, and from a biology perspective, there must be something positive in the uh, cancer in terms of a positive target that we can use. And uh, this, is, this is a patient I had seen uh, about uh, a, a couple of years ago, and I said, yes, absolutely. I'm a big believer in tumor genotyping. We'll genotype the tumor and we'll find an actionable alteration. And so we'll find the positive inside uh, this, this cancer. So we did do tumor genotyping and there were multiple alterations that were noted, TP53, cyclin D2, uh, CDK6, and cyclin E. But unfortunately, none of these are actionable. Uh, while there are multiple alterations that are seen, we don't have targeted therapies against any of these alterations. And this is a common scenario that we see in triple negative breast cancer, where uh, th there is a paucity of actionable alterations. Now, when we talk about actionable alterations, I think we need to be careful. We're talking about actionable genomic alterations. This patient had tumor genotyping and there were no actionable genomic alterations but there are other actionable targets that could still be utilized. And an example being TROPE2. TROPE2 is a pan-epithelial cancer antigen that's overexpressed in majority of triple negative breast cancers. And so it's a receptor, it's like a gate that's present on the surface of uh, breast cancers, including triple negative breast cancer. So if you can engage that gate, it could potentially be utilized for delivery of a targeted therapy. The analogy of this is the Trojan horse story. Uh, this is a, a, a Greek story. Um, the audience might be familiar with it. Uh, this is a story where the Greeks tried to uh, overtake the um, city of Troy. And the way this was done was uh, a wooden horse, a Trojan horse was built and uh, a group of uh, armed men were inside the horse. The, um, the horse was then uh, moved inside the city. And then when it was inside the city, um, the, the army came out and they were able to open the gate, which allowed the rest of the Greek army to come in. So it was a way of delivering this, the select group of army men inside the city. And then inside the city, they could um, deliver what they were intended to do. So it was through this Trojan horse that Greeks were able to enter and destroy the city of Troy, ending the war. And if one were to consider the city of Troy like a cancer cell, it's a similar philosophy. And that's the philosophy of antibody drug conjugate. The idea is that you have an antibody with a payload or army, if you will, linked to it. The antibody would bind to the cancer cell and then deliver the payload to the cancer cell. So here's the schema. Uh, you can see an antibody with a warhead or payload linked to it in orange. The antibody binds to something that's present on the cancer cell like trope two, gets internalized. And then inside the cancer cell, it's able to release the warhead. And so this is a way of further improving the efficacy to toxicity ratio. You can deliver higher doses of pay payload through this antibody drug conjugate mechanism. And then some of the payload could also leak out of the cancer cell and affect the other cells in the tumor microenvironment. So it could address some heterogeneity. If there are some cells that express trope two, others that don't, because of this mechanism by which some of the payload can leak in the surrounding region, you can address heterogeneity. In the phase one, phase two clinical trial in patients with uh, metastatic triple negative breast cancer, uh, with the use of this antibody drug conjugate that targets trope 2 called sasituzumab govitekin, a very long name, uh, now has uh, a trade name of Trodelby. Uh, responses were seen in patients who had received other 
uh, chemotherapy agents. So in the pre-treated metastatic triple negative breast cancer, responses were seen with uh, sasituzumab coptican. And in the pivotal phase three trial, the ASCENT trial, which compared this agent to standard chemotherapy, um, as you can see in a Kaplan-Meier curve, which looks at survival and progression-free survival, uh, there was improvement in uh, progression-free survival and overall survival with uh, sasituzumab covitecan as compared to standard chemotherapy. And I would also like to highlight that this is not perfect. If you look at the median sur progression-free survival with sasituzumab govitecan, while it was better than standard chemotherapy, it was 5.6 months. And overall survival was 12.1 months, which again, while it was better than standard chemotherapy, is far less than adequate. And we need to further improve uh, on these results. We need to shift these curves even further from 12 months to 24 months to 36 months. We need to further improve uh, on what we've seen. So the FDA a uh, couple months ago in April of 2021 granted full approval to sasituzumab covitecan or Trudelvi for patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer uh, who had received two therapies, at least one of them being in the metastatic setting. And as, again, as I mentioned, I think this is a good start, but we need to further improve on the outcomes for our patients with metastatic disease. Now, is the activity restricted to triple negative breast cancer? The answer is no. Trope 2 is also expressed in hormone receptor positive breast cancer. It's a pan epithelial antigen. And in patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, when this drug was investigated, you could also see responses. And there's a phase three trial that has now completed enrollment looking at sasituzumab govitecan versus treatment of physician's choice. So you can see an example of uh, an antibody drug conjugate that is crossing across the traditional subtypes of breast cancer. This is the design of the trial, uh, now completed enrollment, and we anticipate results uh, next year. So this is one example of an antibody drug conjugate, but there are multiple other antibody drug conjugates in clinical development. Other agents that target trope 2, such as datopotumab, duroxetan, targets that, uh, agents that target EGFR, agents that target LIV1, agents that target CEA-CAM. The point is that uh, there are different antigens uh, that are present in breast cancer that could potentially be targeted by antibody drug conjugates and are being investigated in clinical trials. And these various antibody drug conjugates could potentially challenge the current molecular classification of breast cancer, which is based on uh, ER and HER2. Clinical trials are ongoing. It's not ready for prime time yet. Um, but for patients with metastatic breast cancer, these antibody drug conjugates potentially offer options in the form of a clinical trial. Now, in the last uh, few minutes, I want to review an important uh, story. We should never forget uh, what our guiding principles are. And if we talk about a metastatic breast cancer and we talk about next therapy, we should always remember that the goal of therapy is twofold, is to improve survival and to improve or maintain quality of life. It's essentially the theme of the seminar. Our goal of treatment in metastatic breast cancer is survive and thrive. And so any therapy that is used needs to be aligned with this goal of survive and thrive. I'd like to highlight a recent abstract that was presented at ASCO this year, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, that was led by a patient advocate that asked this simple question, um, how about side effects and the dose that's used for patients with metastatic breast cancer? This was a patient advocate-led survey uh, in metastatic breast cancer by Ann Losser and her team. And the idea was fairly simple. Um, patients with metastatic breast cancer uh, have disease that's treatable, often not curable, and patients remain on treatment indefinitely. But often there's less distinction between the dose of drugs that's used in metastatic breast cancer versus early breast cancer. And many times the drug that is used is based on phase one clinical trials 
which are intended to identify the maximum tolerated dose. And this concept of maximum tolerated dose, which was developed for chemotherapy, might not be applicable for targeted therapy. And uh, treatment-related toxicities may impact quality of life. Um, we've seen examples such as with capecitabine, where lower dose can improve tolerability while preserving efficacy. So this group um, developed a survey and, and the question was, can we personalize starting dose in patients with um, metastatic breast cancer? And this was a patient-led survey as part of the patient-centered dosing initiative. Uh, Christine, who's on the call today, was also part of this uh, group. So the goals and methods, the objectives were to do a survey to identify prevalence and severity of side effects among patients with metastatic breast cancer, to improve physician-patient communication, understand how it is, the effect of dose reduction on quality of life, and to review the patient willingness to discuss alternative dosing. Uh, a 27 uh, question survey was formulated, was sent to uh, patients, first a pilot, and then to uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer. And social media was utilized for dissemination of the survey. Uh, they started in August of last year, went on for about a month. There were more than 1,000 patients who participated in the survey. And the results were that majority of patients had a side effect uh, from therapy that was used in the metastatic setting. Majority of them communicated this to the doctor uh, and received assistance. Patients who had a dose reduction because of toxicity, uh, a number of them felt better with the dose reduction. And 92% said that they would be willing to discuss dose with their physicians based on personal attributes. So what's next? Uh, there are three uh, steps that are being undertaken based on the results of the survey. The first is survey of medical oncologists to understand the medical oncologist perspective. And that was completed uh, last month. And we anticipate we'll see results at a future meeting such as San Antonio to compare the patient and oncologist survey results and engage industry as well as regulatory authorities uh, asking this question about the efficacy at different dosage level and how can we select the best dose for an individual patient. Now, finally, finishing on the theme of metastatic breast cancer, we talked about a number of drugs that can target metastatic breast cancer. We talked about the optimal dose that needs to be considered. But how about the question of why did this patient, the index patient have metastatic breast cancer? Why did this patient have disease recurrence? Can we actually prevent breast cancer metastases? For a patient with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, should we use a longer duration of endocrine therapy? And if we look at Hormone receptor positive breast cancer, essentially the recurrence can be divided into two categories. The first is recurrence within the first five years, and the second is recurrence after five years. And it's almost like there are two cells, these red and blue cells, the red cells which cause disease recurrence in first five years, and then these blue or dormant cells that can cause disease recurrence after five years. The challenge is how can we identify um, these cells and how can we identify if there's a patient uh, who's likely going to have disease recurrence. There are some genomic biomarkers that can be used, but there's also emerging interest in monitoring based on blood-based assays, such as circulating tumor DNA. Now, I would caution that the clinical utility of this, of the circulating tumor DNA in the adjuvant setting has not been established. And we've seen examples, for example, with circulating tumor cells, where the clinical utility was not established. In uh, the case of circulating tumor cells, there was a study in the metastatic breast cancer where patients who had presence of circulating tumor cells that did not decline despite therapy were randomized to continue the same therapy was a switch in therapy. And essentially the trial showed that there was no advantage of using circulating tumor cells to guide switch in therapy. Now there were some uh, concerns with the trial in terms of the cutoff and switch from one chemo to the next, but it makes the point that uh, before we have results from a clinical trial, before the utility is established, we should not use uh, any assay or any therapy in routine clinical practice. 
What should be done though, is to do a dedicated study to answer this question. And that is exactly what's being considered uh, in this setting. For patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, um, studies are looking at monitoring circulating tumor DNA. And if circulating tumor DNA is present, considering an intervention uh, to target that uh, circulating tumor DNA. Um, and these studies, which are ongoing and planned, would help us understand what's the value of circulating tumor DNA uh, monitoring and potential intervention. So it's best done in the format of a study, and we're looking forward uh, to these studies as they get rolled out. So to summarize the vision uh, in the 21st century is that of uh, precision medicine. It started with right targeted therapy for the right tumor, but over the years we've realized that it's much more complex. Uh, we need to consider tumor evolution, coexisting alterations, compensatory pathways, also analytical considerations. We need to think beyond genotyping, looking at proteins and antigens, issues of access to therapy, uh, toxicity, financial toxicity, resources. But the idea is that ultimately we want to select the best regimen, could be more than one drug, best regimen for the right patient based on the right test at the right time. All of these four components are important. The regimen, the patient based on the right test and at the right time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Bardia. That was great. Um, if I could ask you to unshare, thanks. Next, we're going to hear from Jamil Rivers. Uh, for those of you who joined a moment late, Jamil is going to give us the patient perspective as a woman who was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, I believe at the age of 39, who has been surviving and thriving. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. I have to say that I was really impressed with Dr. Bardia's presentation. I think it exemplifies just the challenge of what metastatic patients have to um, think about and consider during this time. Um, I think it's really important for us to understand as patients that we're beyond subtype now. <laughs> you know, it really is important to have that uh, precision medicine. Um, and I know me, I'm on my second line of treatment and have had um, some, uh, you know, stability, progression-free stability, stability, but I do know which test that I would ask for and advocate for um, in order to identify what that next actionable target is for my particular treatment. Um, unfortunately, though, in my work in advocacy, I've learned that this isn't really common or um, uh as well known as it should be when it comes to care um, for metastatic patients. And I think we really need to continue to advocate for, uh, you know, genomic and um, genetic testing and molecular testing and liquid biopsies to be included in standard of care when a metastatic patient has progression um, for us to get beyond just looking at subtype. Um, I think also we have to think about um, expanding our thoughts about survivorship. You know, we have so many now patients that are metastatic that are living longer. And we find that a lot of times with the investment or appropriations or even just the structure and design of survivorship programs, it's not including the needs of metastatic patients. And so I think that's also important for just the um, cancer landscape to understand that um, in that scope and that continuum of care, that metastatic also includes survivorship. I, I actually think that if you are a cancer survivor, um, that's when um, you are diagnosed with cancer and you're still breathing, you're a cancer survivor. It doesn't matter what stage you are in treatment. I also think that there isn't too much of a difference between early stagers and metastatic. I mean, in any unless you're triple negative, you're going to be on some type of maintenance therapy potentially in order to keep that, um, cancer at bay. And so it's either progression-free running room, whether it's months or years, but I think we have to change our focus of having such an emphasis on screening and prevention and more so on treating metastasis. And so I'm really encouraged by a lot of the new therapies and treatments that are in development as far as focusing on different markers and mutations. And there's so many things that we don't understand in the tumor microenvironment at this time. But I think as we focus on um, developing treatments that are more 
precise and individual and focused on how that specific cancer is behaving and also studying more so metastatic tumors. You might have um, one metastatic tumor doing one thing in the lung and another thing in the liver. And so really being targeted in order to champ um, you know, crack down on what that cancer is doing so it isn't wreaking havoc on the body. And so I think this is really encouraging to see this type of presentation. And I just also think that it's important for equity so that most patients know what information that they um, need to know and advocate for themselves and for also the guidelines to catch up with the technology and the research, which is really important. And so um, I think that just expanding our thoughts about what survivorship is and including metastatic needs and expanding our um, thoughts about uh, how to treat cancer and knowing that half of uh, breast cancer is, is going to be endocrine resistant at some point and a third of those people who have been treated at an early stage will become metastatic. It's critical for us to, if we're going to save lives, to be more focused on treating metastasis itself. Um, stop focusing on not getting there, but learn um, the lesson from other diseases um, such as leukemia and HIV AIDS and treat and be able to identify how to crack down on how that cancer is behaving instead of just um, having a strategy of not getting too metastatic in the first place, I think is really important. Um, and about equity, just making sure that um, even in uh, um, well-renowned uh, centers, whether it's rural or community or an academic center, that they're able to understand that everyone has to have access to this knowledge and to this access of testing and treatment. And right now, it's there's, there's still a large emphasis on prevention and screening, and also a large emphasis on treating metastatic cancer based on the sequence. And so I think we've learned so much more now and we have to ensure that everyone knows that best practice, the standard in order for us to have longer lives living with um, metastatic breast cancer, we have to be more focused on precision. Thank you so much, Jamil. Those are some really, really great points about equity and this I feel like the whole uh, structure of how we think about metastatic breast cancer is mm -hmm. kind of changing. We used to think we had three yeah. subtypes and now... <laughs> exactly. <it's questioned. laughs> Rightly so. So I'm going to turn it over to Christine. Um, a reminder, if you have some questions and haven't yet, them, yet put them in the, the Q&A function, please do so. And we already do have a few questions there. So Christine, Great, the floor you. is yours. And thanks, Jamil, for your comments and perspective. Um, Jamil and I work together very closely. I'm a clinical trials advisor on her board at Chrysalis. And we run up against a lot of challenges with trying to get genomic testing of, you know, mutations. It's, it becomes, um, you know, we, we definitely have had to really push to make this happen. And we did have a question about sort of the timing of when to, when do you actually, when should somebody actually test for mutations? We know that cancer can change and acquire mutations and lose mutations. And this probably varies by subtype, but I'm just curious, Dr. Bardia, if you can comment on if there's an actual best practice of when to, when to actually do uh, some genomic sequencing of your tumors. A great question. A uh, great question about tumor, geno tumor genotyping, and I'm glad that you know, we're having this discussion. I remember a few years ago at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, this was actually a debate. Uh, it was a debate session asking whether tumor genotyping should be routinely performed or not. And I think in part, the premise of the debate was we should only order a test if we know what we're going to do with the result. So is it actionable or not? And if we look at the current setting of metastatic breast cancer, outside of clinical trials, the actionability is in patients who has hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer has disease progression and first line therapy. Um, if there's presence of a PIK3C mutation, there's an FDA approved therapy in the form of alpelacib that can be used. So how to identify PIK3C mutation or other actionable alterations? I think there are two broad avenues. One is testing the tumor. And if one is testing the tumor or the tissue, it could be done at the time of metastatic diagnosis. At the time of metastatic diagnosis, we routinely test for ERP or HERS2, 
So along with that, you could do tumor genotyping in text for other actionable alterations like PIK3CA. And while you won't act on that result immediately, in the future, if need be, if the patient has disease progression, then you're not waiting. You already have the result and you could start a therapy. The second option is to do the liquid biopsies or these plasma-based tests. And that usually, in my opinion, should be done at the time of disease progression because the tumor could change. These results usually take seven to 10 days to come back. So comparatively, not that long uh, and can be done with the ease of a blood test, but it can provide value. We do know that about 10 to 15% of patients can acquire mutations in PIK3CA. So if you miss it in the tumor genotyping and you do it based on a blood test later on, you can identify an actionable alteration. Wonderful, thank you, thank you for that. We had another question from Dr. Gilks, and this is a question that's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> I lead a brain metastasis initiative and uh, it was about the sazituzumab govitikin trial. And um, she was asking if patients with brain metastasis were included in the trial. And maybe you can comment on the, I, I think there are future trials that may include brain mets patients. So if you could comment on that, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think brain mets uh, is a big unmet need in the field of uh, breast oncology and we need better therapies that can target brain mets. As far as sasetuzumab govitikan is concerned, in the uh, phase three clinical trial with ASCENT, uh, patients who had progressive or increasing brain meds were not eligible. Uh, unfortunately, that is something that's routinely written in clinical trials. It's something that's been discussed with the FDA and the FDA is much more open now uh, to allowing patients who have uh, disease progression in the brain to enroll in clinical trials. The HER2 climb is a good example where this was allowed. So hopefully we'll see more and more of that. So in the ASCEND trial, unfortunately, patients who had disease progression in the brain were not allowed. But having said that, there's a separate study that was conducted by um, uh, the, uh, the SWA group where they looked at patients who had brain metastases, including metastases from breast cancer as well as other cancers, and looked at the efficacy of sasituzumab govitikin. They also did some biomarker work to look at the levels of the drug in the uh, spinal fluid, and they found that the drug does reach the blood, can cross the blood-brain barrier, and they could detect uh, levels of the drug in spinal fluid. Uh, and in that small study, they saw activity with sasituzumab govitikin. So this has led to a larger uh, uh, cooperative group trial with SWOG as well as other cooperative groups that would specifically look at sasituzumab govitikin for patients with brain metastases. Great, thank you. Yeah, we do know that we see a lot of uh, exclusions and I see now with brain metastases patients that there, there's an allowance for patients with stable brain metastasis. Um, unfortunately, I think that's still not good enough. I think we could go further. I think patients that have stable brain mets um, aren't the patients that actually need the trials. So uh, I hope to continue that work and I'm happy to hear that we're, we're gonna be expanding that option with the um, Tradel v sazituzumab govitikin. Uh, we did have a good question here about healthcare coverage providers uh, being engaged and educated. And I think this is actually a question for Jamil. Jamil is working very closely uh, with research institutions, ensuring that the patients are getting the care and that they need and the resources that they need. And so one of the questions was, are they adding uh, nurse advocates to the patient profile to help assist with genetic and genomic testing uh, in an effort to, you know, make sure that we are personalizing our care to patients. Jamil, do you have any comments about, about the healthcare and how your patients are doing in the cohorts that you work with? Well, we definitely find that there's a lack of capacity, unfortunately, um, in many centers when it comes to just providing this information, having that um, team-based care, making sure that that patient-clinician communication is sufficient enough to ensure that the patient has um, a quality level of health literacy and being able to um, understand the implications of their treatment, how it works, their diagnosis and all of that. Um, and a lot of that is um, influenced by bias and um, inequities in the care setting, meaning that typically if it is a patient where they happen to be of color, 
those resources are just not readily provided initially. It's something that um, the patient has to chase down or they have to work with community organizations like us where we're advocating and teaching the patient what to, how to seek out that support. It's not um, initially presented to them. Um, we do find that even with um, patients with a lot of resources and privilege, it's still um, challenging in order to kind of navigate through the labyrinth and be able to get that um, available information and resources and information, and even also um, working with their insurance companies or if they're dealing with Medicaid or Medicare um, challenges and explaining and advocating for um, the rationale for these tests and how it can be um, needed for treatment decisions. So I still think that there's a long way to go, but the reason why we are working with research organizations is because we're very data-driven. We want to demonstrate the efficacy and also how on the trajectory it does improve outcomes in the long run. So it's a win-win for everybody where the patients are doing well. Um, of course, the centers are providing equitable care and quality care, and also it's reducing cost. And so payers, I think, would want to provide that personalized information and guidance to patients to understand how to make the best treatment decisions. And if they can stay on that continuum, the, less, the more improved their outcomes are going to be down the line. Yeah, and I think um, I just want to say, Jamil, that, you know, I think you're actually being humble with the work that you're doing because the outcomes have been incredible. Yes. Um, just this intervention of giving patients the tools that they would need to actually educate themselves about their disease has improved survival. I mean, Jamil is tracking all of this. I hope to see it at a future conference as a presentation. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think just going back to kind of these patient-led initiatives, uh, Dr. Bardia did talk about Ann Lozier's initiative, the Patient-Centered Dosing Initiative. And um, I will send the, I'll make sure that I send the, the URL to that website it's just the rightdose.org. We had some questions about uh, any reports and findings from that. I was only minimally involved. Anne called me very early and just said, what, what can, what's a big problem in the metastatic community that we can actually, a tangible, pro a problem that has a tangible solution? And we kind of brainstormed a couple ideas. And she said, I think patient-centered dosing is something we can take on. And it's just very exciting, I think, as a patient to see advocates leading these initiatives. And I hope that it encourages researchers and clinicians to involve patients in these research processes because we do bring up a perspective that you don't have. And so I just think, I'm glad that Dr. Brady, I'm glad you mentioned it. I don't know if there was any other comments you wanted to make about the patient-centered dosing initiative. It got a lot of buzz at ASCO. I was very happy to see that. Were there any other additional findings that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, no, absolutely. I would say you know, two, two things. The first is, uh, you know, it's been great working with the uh, patient advocate team. And uh, at least in the past few years, I've never seen, you know, presentation by a patient advocate um, and the, as an oral presentation in the breast uh, uh, track. And it just highlights how important this, this issue is. And that's why I was talking about our guiding principles. We should never forget our guiding principles, which is this talk as well, which is uh, survive and thrive, I think it nicely highlights an issue what Jamil also brought up, which is survivorship. We need to keep that in mind uh, that even patients with metastatic breast cancer are uh, going to have issues with toxicity and we need to be very mindful of that. It's about improving quality of life. The second thing I would highlight is that this has uh, generated a lot of interest and uh, about a week ago, uh, I saw an announcement by the FDA that the FDA would now, requ now require that uh, sponsors conduct trials in the uh, phase two setting, looking at different dosages of drug. So before drugs get approved, the sponsors would have to show that a particular dose is the best dose before it gets moved and before it gets approved. So that's a welcome development. Uh, and hopefully we'll continue to see more research around this issue of what's the best dose for a patient with metastatic breast cancer. So I love that because I just, for any patients that are on the on the call right now listening in, um, we really do have a strong voice and it just takes a little bit of willpower, <laughs> some time, some blood, sweat and tears, and you can make things change. You can get things done. So thanks for highlighting that. 
We had a question about, um, they, the question was about what we've discussed today. Many of the drugs that we've talked about are actually in clinical trials, but some have actually been approved already. Um, could you just comment about, I, I think the question is how, how long will it take for these drugs that are in trials to actually become mainstream? Some of which actually are mainstream, but can you just comment on that process? Because I think it is something that we don't always know what ha what's happening behind the scenes. Some of this work is decades of work before a drug gets approved. Can you just comment on kind of that bench to bedside process and maybe also what, what's coming up, um, anything in the future that's in trials now that we think is going to actually be a viable option for patients in the future. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of progress that's being made. And while it can, it can seem like long, the process from uh, being in, uh, drug being investigated in a clinical trial to approval is actually shortened over the past few years, as opposed to 10 or 15 years ago. You know, traditionally, it would be phase one and phase two and then phase three. And the whole process could be 10 to 15 years. But if you look at a couple of recent examples, if it's a good drug, this whole process uh, is, is much short. For example, uh, for say, palvocyclib or Ibrans, that was a drug that was uh, approved based on a randomized phase two trial, not a phase three trial, but a phase two trial because the results were so promising. And it's through this accelerated um, approval pathway that FDA has. Similarly for sacituzumab govitecan, it was initially approved based on the results of a phase two trial, a single arm phase two trial, not a randomized phase three trial. So I think the regulators um, see that there's a unmet need in the field. And if there's a drug that people feel confident uh, is a good drug and it can be rolled out to other patients, I think uh, FDA has these mechanisms by which drugs can be approved faster. It's all about faster and more efficient um, clinical trials so that drugs which are effective can reach patients. Yeah, I think especially in the HER2 setting, we've just seen so many drug approvals. It's been kind of amazing. I was diagnosed with HER2 disease six years ago. And at that time, I was only offered Herceptin and Progetta. And I think Ketsyla had already been approved, but now there's just so many more. So in that short amount of time, it's been, it's been incredible. I will say, however, I would like to see more drug approvals for the other subtypes. I do feel that HER2 is obviously, you know, a very aggressive disease, but so is triple negative, so is hormone receptor positive, especially when we see patients progress on a CDK inhibitor. There's just not that many options. So I would love to see more options in the future for the other subtypes. So we are about out of time. Um, I'd like to echo what you guys were just saying at the, at the end uh, that, you know, the, the clinical the, the, the development pathway for a drug from bench to bedside does seem to have gotten shorter and we have really and truly seen not only more drugs become approved, but meaningful differences in survival. And so women are, <clears throat> and men with metastatic breast cancer are living for longer and longer and we're working to make it even better and to focus on reducing toxicity. So a big thank you to uh, Dr. Bardia for an amazing forward thinking presentation and challenging us to think about how we approach metastatic breast cancer in a new way. And to Jamil Rivers, <coughs> excuse me, for sharing her inspiring story and all the amazing work that she is doing to uh, advocate for patients living with metastatic breast cancer. And to uh, Christine for her wonderful moderating and all of her amazing work also. Um, our series, just so you guys all know, is uh, sponsored by the Jane Rice Survivorship Program in Breast Cancer and uh, support from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And um, oops, this is, um, we will be, as I said earlier, we'll be sending you a link to complete the webinar and would appreciate you doing so within a week if possible. And we really will listen and use it towards planning for next year's webinars or hopefully some more in-person events. Finally, um, as you may know, this is part of a series and we're focusing on various aspects of breast cancer surviving and thriving. We're gonna take a little break for the summer and then the next webinar will be called Enhancing Quality of Life After a Breast Cancer Diagnosis presented by Dr. Mariam Lusberg and that will be September 30th uh, from noon to 1 p.m. And I believe that uh, 
that is the end of our webinar. We'd really like to thank everybody for a wonderful discussion and for joining us. And a big thank you again to our presenters. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>